Hello, Archie Dunlop here with Talking Astrology with Archie. In this video, I'm going to look at the astrology and the I Ching for the week starting on Monday, May the 6th, 2024. And this is a week which runs through until Sunday, May the 12th, 2024. So I'm going to give you an idea, first of all, about how this video is going to be structured. First of all, I'm going to look at what is going on this week. And I will just give a blow-by-blow -blow account of what I see as being the most important astrological events. And having done that, I'm going to consider the people who I believe might be impacted by these events. And not just the people, but also I'm going to consider a structure, specifically the Kirsch Bridge, which I, I talked about that in my last video, the Kirsch Bridge, this bridge linking um, Crimea with the mainland. And I'm actually going to look at the horoscope for when Russia um, annexed Crimea, because I think the bridge and Crimea, stuff going on this week, I think the bridge is vulnerable. I mean, everyone is saying the bridge is vulnerable. This is nothing new. You don't have to be into astrology to say that. Everyone is talking about the Ukrainians are desperate to attack the bridge, even though it's not used for, at the moment, I don't believe it's any actually used for military purposes. Um, there are other ways of supplying Ukraine, but it, it sorry, of, of supplying Crimea. But still, it, I think the Ukrainians would regard it as a PR victory if they could inflict some damage on this bridge, which as far as I can see is essentially now a piece of civilian infrastructure. But I do want to consider the bridge and Crimea. But there'll be people I'll be looking at. You know, you can see on the thumbnail, I've got uh, um, Hamza Yusuf, uh, got King Abdullah II of Jordan, Prince Charles, uh, and uh, Prince Harry. So I'll be talking about them in this in this video so i'll be i'll be looking at their at their horoscopes and having done that i'm going to look at the i ching for today so just a reminder of how i do this is that my i ching reading in this video is for people who watch the i ching segment if you don't watch a segment, it's, it has nothing to do with you. Um, I'm only predicting for people watching this segment. So if you don't watch it, what I say is irrelevant. So if you don't want your I Ching done, then when you come to the I Ching segment in this video, just, just don't watch it. Um, you can uh, stop watching a video. You can, you can um, watch something else. And my I Ching reading will be divided into four sections. There'll be a general section, then I'm going to look at uh, money, then career, and finally relationships. Okay, so let's look at what is happening this week astrologically. So here is the positions of the planets right at the beginning of a week, when the week starts New York time, midnight New York, Monday, May the 6th. And so these are, if you like, the start positions. And, you know, for example, we can see the moon starts at, starts a week, New York time, at 19 degrees Aries. And um, the sun starts a week uh, at, at 16 degrees Taurus. So that is the beginning of the week. And as far as I'm concerned, there are three main events. The first main event is taking place on May the 6th, which is Monday. And that event is a semi-square between Saturn and Pluto. So there is Pluto at 2 degrees 6 Aquarius. And there is... Saturn at 17 degrees 4 Pisces. So Saturn and Pluto are exactly 
45 degrees apart. And this semi-square is going to create, I think, a feeling of great tension. I mean, Pluto wants to transform. Perhaps it has ideas about the way things should be changed, but Saturn is holding on. People want to change, people are resisting change, and they're trying to occupy the same space. And you get a struggle. And I think many of us may feel very tense. It, it is a tense time. It feels as if something has to give. And really, you know, that is how the week starts. And as Monday progresses, uh, you can see that the week starts with the moon at 19 degrees Taurus. But the moon will soon, will move into, sorry, the moon will it starts a week at 19 degrees Aries. But when the moon moves into Taurus, it makes a square to Pluto. It also makes a semi-square to Saturn. So what we're going to find sort of late Monday into Tuesday is the tension is going to increase. So I, I do think for many of us, the week starts on, yeah, on quite a tense note, although this, this aspect between Saturn and Pluto does have a transpersonal nature. It may affect society at large, how people as a group think, people as a group will believe that they're under pressure, that they just can't go on like this. Absolutely. Something has to give. And I would have said, really, that this Saturn-Pluto square is arguably the most important event of the week because you've got these two slow-moving planets coming together in a semi-square. It's a relatively unusual event and they really describe the tensions that are, you know, that are going on in society. We can see them everywhere. You know, it's not just your country, it's other countries. You know, I think people very often when they look at the place they live, it often seems terrible. You know, if you're living in the UK, the UK, the UK might just seem a disaster zone. If you're living in Ireland, I mean, reading bad stories about Ireland and the pressures, you know, that, that, that are being experienced in, in that country. Yeah, but there are worse places. There are always worse places. I mean, people in the US think they've got it bad. Everyone kind of thinks they've got it bad, don't they? And they think that their own country is very often the worst place to be. But that's not necessarily true. And I suppose, yeah, the grass is always greener. And maybe with this Saturn semi-square Pluto, we're going to have a, sense, a certain sense of feeling trapped. Wherever we are, we can't get away from it. This is what we're... What we're what we're stuck in and somehow we've got to deal with it then on may the 8th which is a wednesday we have a new moon and i've already talked about this new moon and as far as i'm concerned this new moon is not particularly major <laughs> um, i think this new moon is probably the third most important event of the week the most important event of the week, I think, is Saturn semi-square. Pluto, um, and the third most important is this new moon. Uh, I mean, I'll just go over this new moon uh, again, just to, just to explain to you why I think it's um, unimportant. Firstly, or, OK, I'm not saying it's unimportant, but, you know, if you see events happening this week, which are surprising difficult um they come out of the blue i don't think it'll be to do with the new moon the new moon may help trigger these events but fundamentally it's to do with either the saturn semi-square pluto which we've which we got at the beginning of a week or mars semi-square uranus which we've got at the end of the week and i'll be talking about mars semi-square uranus in a moment this new moon on on uh, Wednesday, March 8th, I mean, this is set for London time. I make it, but it's at 
4.22 in the morning on Wednesday. Uh, it's 18 degrees to Taurus. As I said yesterday, that, that new moon, it's on the Venus-Jupiter midpoint. This new moon is quite gentle. Uh, it's, you know, it's, it's, not, um, it's not an eclipse. It's, I mean, it's still important in the sense that the new moon is the beginning of a new cycle. So if we're starting, if we want to start a new project, for example, we should wait until after the new moon. Because, you know, bef immediately before the new moon, you know, the, the moon is waning. The waning moon is unfortunate, all things being equal. So after the new moon, the moon is getting bigger and we're in the waxing phase of the moon. And we'll just feel that things are getting better. Things are improving. And I think we'll be helped by the fact that this new moon is on the Venus-Jupiter midpoint. So if anything this new moon is actually quite fortunate. It's a new moon which is going to give us a boost, uh, allows us to be optimistic. And perhaps if other things aren't going right, this new moon will perhaps give us a, f a certain faith that in the end, things will turn out fine. We just have to believe in ourselves and not be buffeted by short-term problems. So that's a new moon. Don't think it's very important, but if anything, I think this new moon is going to be fortunate. Now, that does not mean to say that the new moon is in all cases going to have an unfortunate impact on people because you have to consider their charts. What else is going on in their charts? You have to, you have to look at it in terms of other thing, other other things, and are we looking at Har Prince Harry's chart very soon in relationship to this new moon? But the main event, the main thing going on this week is Mars semi-square Uranus, and here is the chart for Mars semi-square Uranus. This takes place on. May the 11th, which I think is a Saturday. Is that right? London time, it's at least London time, it's Saturday at 1.22 a.m. If you are in the Americas, it will be late on Friday. So Friday, Saturday, um, there is this Mars semi-square Uranus. So you can see the semi-square. There's Mars 758 Aries. There's Uranus at 758 Taurus. And, you know, so Mars and Uranus are, are 45 degrees apart. So Mars and Uranus as a pair are potentially dangerous. They're all about accidents. Um, yesterday and the day before, I... I talked about Mars conjunct Uranus. So we've got Mars conjunct Uranus on Algol in, on um, July, July the 15th. Um, that is going to be particularly difficult and particularly destructive. And as I tried to explain, I think it's going to be particularly bad for the US and the UK and maybe for Ukraine. That, that is, is a possibility. Um, so Mars semi-square Uranus is it's not quite as difficult as the conjunction, and it, it's not on Algol, but still, it it is problematic. It is violent, and it is it is certainly happening at the at the end of the week. And this Mars Uranus conjunction is happening at a time when Jupiter is conjunct Algol. Uh, Look at look at Jupiter's 26, 20, 28 Taurus. That's where Jupiter is at the moment. It's, this week, Jupiter is around 26 Taurus. Jupiter's 26, 27 Taurus. In other words, Jupiter is on Algol. And this is quite a difficult one to interpret Jupiter on Al Algol. Because if you if you look at, you know, Vivian Robson's book on fixed stars, he he lists all, some of the planets and what it, what it means when they're on Algol, but he doesn't talk about Jupiter. 
he he kind of focuses on the malefics and just remember so remember what algol means algol is the head of the demon aras algul i think that's arabic meaning head of the demon and it's connected with decapitation disaster things going wrong but then we've got jupiter jupiter's a benefic so what does it mean when jupiter is conjunct algol um did i say yeah benefic jupiter benefic conjunct algol now that might mean that some of us or some people can benefit from unfortunate events there's always something someone benefiting from something however bad it is if you've got a war if you've got disaster if you've got tragedy there's always someone benefiting from it and perhaps that's what jupiter is about jupiter and jupiter conjunct taurus may be sorry conjunct algol could be about people plotting bad things and being able to benefit from bad things maybe sort of criminal enterprises or um just bad things bad things and people gaining from them there are always vultures on there and so i think that is one way of looking at jupiter conjunct algol you might just also say well jupiter expands what it touches and so maybe jupiter conjunct algol will just bring algol jupiter will just bring the the symbolism of algol just down here on earth and is just going to just create disaster anyway and whether or not someone benefits from it is beside the point but with saturn semi square pluto and mars semi square uranus and jupiter conjunct algol i think you're getting the picture and that new moon on the venus jupiter midpoint which i mean i think that new moon is a relatively fortunate new moon it's got a lot of work to do i think um to um improve the situation you know we've got we're going to have to think really positively about this week because yeah overall i think it is going to be a difficult week and then i have to consider who is going to be impacted this week well i mentioned the um the bridge <laughs> kirsch bridge so i think it was yesterday i looked at the chart of the kirsch bridge when it was inaugurated by vladimir putin uh, on may the 15th 2018 i don't know what time it was um inaugurated and the thing is if you if you look at this chart you can see you can see that it was just it happened around the time of a new moon so let's just compare the kirsch bridge with the mars uranus um um uh, with the mars uranus semi square so we'll have the kirsch bridge and the mars uranus semi square so there is the moon now we don't know exactly where the moon was when this bridge was opened i'm assuming it wasn't opened at the middle of the night or really early in the morning so it was probably opened around noon but i don't know precisely i mean i suppose the moon could have been 1 degree either side we just a couple of degrees either side it's possible but certainly uranus is pretty close to the moon at the time of the opening of the kirsch bridge and of course mars is going to be semi square that moon um at some stage at the end of a week and of course this roughly coincides with russia's victory day or celebrations and i think you know there are a lot of celebrations going on in russia and people are saying this is the time that ukraine is going to want to attack the kirsch bridge and so with this mars semi square uranus hitting uh the moon and to a lesser extent the sun uh 
we might expect something to be to be happening here. It doesn't mean to say the Ukrainians are going to be successful in terms of destroying the bridge for a long period of time. And this also links up with the chart for the annexation of Crimea. So in 2014, um, I remember Crimea used to be uh, a de facto part of Ukraine. I mean, it's still, I suppose, in terms of international law, it's still de jure um, part of Ukraine, but now it is pretty much de facto, de facto Russian. And this was a time when de facto Russian, Russia gained de facto control over uh, Ukraine. So here is a chart for the, uh, for the annexation of Crimea, March the 18th, 2014. I've gone for noon because I don't know what the precise time was. And the Saturn at the time of the annexation was at 23.7 Scorpio. And if you if you compare this with um, the Mars Uranus semi-square, uh, you can see that there is there is Saturn, and Uranus is pretty close to the opposition of Saturn, and Mars is pretty close to the sesquiquadrate. So. Sat the Saturn of the bridge, which I suppose, of, sorry, of Crimea. Crimea, Saturn would, you could say that in a way that represents Crimea's boundaries, its defences, how it tries to protect itself, is really under pressure from that, that, that Mars Uranus square. So, you know, I think there is, you know, a real possibility that, well, maybe, it, I mean, I, I, astrology aside, there are many people saying it's almost, it's very, very likely that uh, Ukraine will attack the Kirsch Bridge. You know, they've really signaled this um, for PR reasons, even though from a military perspective, as I understand it, it's pretty much of no meaning whatsoever. So when we look at Kirsch Bridge, when we look at the chart of the annexation of Crimea, we can, you know, we can, we can see the vulnerability and we can see how it links with this Mars-Uranus semi-square. Someone else who might be impacted by the week's events might be Prince Harry. So here is uh, Prince Harry's chart. I know we're really bored of Prince Harry, aren't we? Uh, so I'll try not to spend too long on him. So here's, here is uh, here's Prince Harry, his chart. And... You can see that Prince Harry has his IC at 17.2 Taurus and his moon at 21.20 uh, Taurus. So the new moon today, sorry, the new moon this week, um, which is at 18 degrees 2 Taurus, is actually pretty close to Harry's IC. Now, that may not be a bad thing. I know that, you know, I you know have I have had a certain tendency to be negative about Harry and Meghan. But if you look at this new moon, new moons tend to be more fortunate than full moons. New moons are about beginnings. This new moon is on the Mars. It is on the. Um, Venus Mars midpoint. So you could say the transiting Venus Mars, Mars midpoint is on Harry's IC. Uh, he's got a new moon on his IC. Um, this, if Harry knows what he's knows what's good for him, Harry needs to kind of turn over a new leaf with this new moon. I think that uh, he needs to think about what it means to be comfortable and secure and grounded now that doesn't mean to say that this new moon is going to suddenly make him feel comfortable and, and secure and grounded it may give him an insight about what is actually needed i mean it may well be that if harry has freedom 
as sensitive to what's going on uh, that perhaps he'll realize that he's in the wrong place, that he needs to go somewhere else, somewhere else to find real security. I mean, I know a lot of people are saying that Harry is desperate to go back to the UK. I don't know. It could be somewhere else. But I think that Harry, if he's sufficiently self-aware with this new moon, is going to get a sense of where he should be going. So if I were to be advising Harry, then I would suggest that he just takes it easy, just relaxes and just imagines where he'd like to be and where he'd like to feel comfortable. And I think that if he gave himself the space, I mean, this is not this is not about Megan, it's just about Harry. And that's what he needs to do. And that is a a positive way for Harry to use the energies of the new moon. Of course, the problem with the new moon might be that Harry gets an insight about where he'd like to be and it might clash with where Meghan wants to be. So that is a possibility, which brings us on to the chart of Harry and Meghan's marriage, which... I've looked at uh, very recently, uh, but I'm going to do it again. And here it is. Um, this, I believe, is a time, the exact time they became man and wife. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong. And the midheaven on this chart is at is 2338 Taurus. Um, so we can link that with the Mars Uranus semi square. And so if we So there is Uranus. Uranus is getting very close to the mid heaven of the marriage. And it's at a time when Mars is getting very close to the Transiting Mars is getting very close to the semi-square with the mid-heaven. And so in terms of a marriage, what does a mid-heaven mean? I suppose it's the direction that Harry and Meghan want to move their marriage. Where, you know, what they envisage for their marriage, where they look like it to go as a, as a team, as a couple. And I think with Uranus semi-square Mars... There may be a disagreement here. It may be that it becomes clear that Harry's priorities about where the marriage should be going and what they should be doing and Meghan's priorities may be at odds with one another. And, you know, this does come at a time when you've got this new moon on Harry's IC, when actually Harry is starting to understand what the meaning of home is, where home is, and and maybe it, it does conflict with... Megan's views. But so I think there's interesting stuff going on, but it's the kind of stuff that I don't think will see the light of day, certainly not in a short term. It's it's going to be stuff that is going to be, I think, um quite private, um, and it's not going to be publicized. So continuing on the royal theme, um in fact, no, I'm not going to continue on the role theme for the moment. I just want to quickly look at the horoscope of the First Minister of Scotland. I believe he's still the First Minister of Scotland. I know he's tendered his resigning. He's going to go very soon uh, until you know they need to find a replacement. And that is Humza Yousaf, who is, yes, First Minister of Scotland. And Humza Yousaf, he has... His, he has this moon conjunct Scorpio, moon conjunct Saturn in Scorpio um, on his ascendant uh, in the first house. And that moon is um, really hit by the, Uran by the Mars Uranus um, semi square. In fact, it's hit by the new moon as well. He has got a new moon on his. Um, the new moon at 18.2, what's it said, 18.2 Taurus is um, conjunct his Mars, it's conjunct his descendant, 
now, you would have thought that it wouldn't matter because he's already attended his resignation, but it, it may be that even though he's told the world he's going, that he is going, it could be still, it still could be a very difficult time for him. I'm not quite sure why. Uh, his enemies are perhaps coming out of a woodwork, even though he's going with that new moon on, a des- on, on his descendant and that new moon on his hitting his Mars and hitting his descendant. And at the same time, uh, he's got Uranus on his, conjunct his moon. He's going to have, uh, he'll ha- and he will have Mars um, sesquiquadrate his moon. Let me just put up the, so you show you what I mean. So There's Uranus at 2258. So he's at the moment. He, remember, he's a, he's born in Scotland. So Scottish births always are. Uh, you've got always have a time on the um, on the birth certificate. So we really do know what time he was born. It's not just a noon chart. And so Uranus is going to be opposition his Moon uh, at the end of the week, and Mars is going to be. There, Mars is going to be obsessed with quadrate his moon, and as we said, we just had a new moon on his descendant. So, um, Hamza Yusuf is going to be under a lot of pressure. I mean, he, I believe, he is still first minister of Scotland. So, the things he does, the things he says, and the things people say to him could be quite dramatic. So, we perhaps haven't quite seen the end of Hamza Yusuf in terms of um, surprises, and there may be things going on that he is not fully aware of. So I thought I just wanted to mention that. Now I want to look at, uh, yes, the chart of um, Charles III. So here's Charles III's horoscope. Now Charles, but the king, has his son at 2225 Scorpio and he's got actually sun on his fifth house fifth house cusp so the sun I suppose could represent his children William and Harry and that sun is getting hit by Mars and Uranus so he's going to have Uranus opposition his sun and he's going to have Mars sesquiquadrate his sun. So that Mars that Mars Uranus semi-square at the end of a week on um sort of May the tenth or eleventh, I think May the eleventh, hits his sun. And I think so I think that's that could impact not just him, but uh, what his children are up to. I suppose one thing, you know, Harry is always capable of stuff. What's Harry gonna do next? So there could be some dramas. It may not just be his son as well. He's he's a king. He's, he's got the son in Scorpio. And remember, King Charles III is the British head of state. It's not just about him. It's about the country who he rules. Remember, the king is the land is the king, and the king is the land. So, in some ways, even though he's a constitutional monarch, he does symbolise the country. So, with Uranus opposition the king's son you could say that Uranus is opposition the country's son and Mars is set to quadrate it as well so at the end of a week um, we may see things going on with Charles we may see you know we, we don't know what his children are up to we don't know what Harry is up to and we may say we may also see things going on with the country with um, Uranus hitting this point, and there is um, another king to consider, and that is King Abdullah the um, second. So here is King Abdullah the second's chart. Uh, you know, I always sort of feel a certain sympathy towards King Abdullah the second because. Uh, you know, I actually, um, I went to a boarding school uh, in Surrey and uh, he, he was in my year. He was in my, he was in, I was once in a class with King Abdullah II. I remember that, that class. I was, it was one of those rare classes where I came, where I came first in every subject except for French. And I think 
King Abdullah. He did he did well in French. I remember that his French was good. I also I also have a memory of King Abdullah. He had this brother, Faisal. So Abdullah and Faisal they were um. I remember they were at the dining room table and they were uh, talking in Arabic and this prefect re- reprimanded them for talking in Arabic. It's considered to be rude to talk in Arabic at the um, at the dining room table, which I, I thought was a bit unfair. I mean, why shouldn't him and his brother talk in Arabic? Um, but yeah, I, I, d- I did go to school with him. And uh, so I do, ha- I do have a certain sympathy for him. And it's it's... It's it's a tough job being king of Jordan. I mean, it's a really dangerous job. And perhaps one of the reasons he's been able to sort of survive so well is the fact that he's got Mars rising. You know, he's got uh, his ascendant is at 1921 Capricorn and Mars is at uh, 2749 um, Capricorn and... So yeah, Mars is Mars is exalted in Capricorn. So I think he's got a strong Mars, and I think he really needs that strong Mars. And anyway, the problem is at the moment is that um, there's his Moon in Scorpio. I think that's that's quite a difficult Moon in Scorpio. Is it or is it? Um, I mean, the advantage about his Moon in Scorpio is that he was born at night. And so the moon is obviously a nocturnal planet. It's in Scorpio, so it's in a um, feminine sign where it should be because moon is, and it's above the horizon. And so perhaps that moon in Scorpio, which on the surface looks quite di- difficult and dangerous because it's in Scorpio, when you actually consider where it is, it's actually in the right place. Nocturnal planet in a nighttime chart. Feminine planet in a feminine sign. A nocturnal planet at night above the horizon. And that might actually give him a sensitivity to popular feeling. I mean, which, of course, you must have if you want to be, if you want to survive as a king in a place like Jordan. Um, There must be threats all the time. Of course, he got through the Arab Spring. And so maybe he has a sensitivity uh, to what's, you know, to to what's going on. And, you know, obviously after Gaza, this would have been, must have been an extremely disturbing thing for him to have to manage this and having to deal with those kind of pressures. But that moon in Scorpio is under pressure this week, at the end of the week. And um, so... To give you an idea, let's just compare it. Uh, so there's his moon in Scorpio, 2312. There, there is Uranus at, at 2258 Taurus. So the end of the week, he has got Uranus opposition the moon and he has got Mars sesquiquadrate his moon. And... To be honest, I think that could be quite dangerous. Uh, if I were to advise him, I would have said at the end of the week, this is, I mean, he needs to be really careful that security, whatever, is really important. And I suppose the moon might be about popular unrest. It might be some kind of threat, something going on that he wasn't expecting. But I would have thought that Abdullah has to be really, really careful because, um, you know, uh, that moon is so important to him um it it it's it in it has that strength which is that it has that unexpected strength and being under pressure from uranus and mars yeah he 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 needs to be really careful i think so um king abdullah the second is is someone we should perhaps be um watching out for at the end of the week and I suppose into next week. Well, it's Mars. You see, Mars is a trigger. You see, he's got Uranus opposition his moon. And so that Uranus opposition the moon, you know, it could have an impact a week or even two weeks either side. But it's the Mars is a trigger. When that Mars makes the, sesqu- makes the um, 
the sesquiquadrate, that's when you might ex expect an event to happen. And that would be, I think, at the end of the week. I think it would be at the end of the week, yes. Okay, so that's Abdullah. And now I want to look at the I Ching. So I asked a question, um, well, before I tell you what I asked, just a rem reminder, if you do not want your I Ching to be um, read, if you're not interested in having an I Ching forecast, just you, you don't have to watch anymore. You can stop watching this video because my forecast only applies to people who are watching the I Ching segment. Okay, so I asked the question, what is the week starting on Monday, the May the 6th, 2024, going to be like for those watching the I Ching segment of this video? And the first hexagram I got, and so this is my general reading, uh, it was hexagram 45 which is gathering together and this suggests that this week you know, it's very important to consider other people and our position in the group and I think we get the idea that some people belong together as some people do not belong together. And what we have to do is seek out the people who we should be with. We can't be with everyone and we certainly can't be friends with everyone. So who are the people who we can benefit from? We really do need to seek them out. But that is not always going to be easy. I think there are going to be times, you know, particularly the beginning of a week, when we feel somewhat isolated, or sort of beginning, middle of a week, where we feel isolated. We just feel that we're not able to be at the centre of things. And, you know, we're wondering how we can get noticed and perhaps in dealing in terms of dealing with people. We know who we should be dealing with, but we feel that we're, to an extent, on the fringes. And I think the advice here is that we just need to, need to persist because, you know, we do need to be with people this week. I think it's, it is very important. And this hexagram 45, it does move because we've got the second... Second the line, second line from the bottom moves, and the third line from the bottom moves, and so it moves to hexagram twenty eight preponderance of the great, and so this might suggest that you know we are looking for support. We're trying to seek out support. We can get support and find companionship to a certain level but not all the way and preponderance of the great does indicate that we might find ourselves burdened perhaps because we don't get all the support we need and so we've got something that we're really carrying that it, it almost feels unbearable but the way to deal with it is we can't just stop and of course I must give the warning that I'm, you know, I'm, I'm talking about things in a symbolic sense. I'm, you know, if you really are carrying a literal heavy load, you know, you've got to look after your health. You don't want to do yourself an injury. But from a symbolic sense, with preponderance of the great, the advice is that if you stop, you will just sink. And that the best way to carry a big load is to keep moving. And if you can keep moving, you will be able to bear it, you will be able to deal with it, and you will be able to live up to your responsibilities. And the fact that you don't get have all the support you feel you need won't, in the end, matter. 
from a financial perspective, we are perhaps feeling that we need support and advice from others. Uh, perhaps we are thinking about spending money and we don't really want to spend all that money ourselves. Maybe we feel someone else should chip in or we need a contribution. We don't want to take the whole financial burden ourselves. And so perhaps the advice here is to get help from others. And perhaps there can be uh, some sort of you know, joint venture where everyone gets some money together. Uh, that's perhaps what's needed to be done. But it may be difficult to get the support and to get the enthusiasm that you feel that you're, you're looking for. And so, yeah, don't be surprised if it takes longer than expected to make connections with other people in a, from a sort of financial sense. And people just might actually be unwilling to give you the money you feel you deserve or to contribute fairly. And this just might be the way it is. And I, I'm afraid, well, that leads to hexagram 28, which is preponderance of the great which you may feel that from a from a financial perspective you do have a certain burden to carry it is a it is a responsibility and it might also be talking about some kind of financial issue or problem that you have to deal with on your own you were hoping you were going to get some advice but Perhaps the advice isn't forthcoming. But once you've started a process of trying to engage with a financial issue, you can't stop. You've just got to keep carrying on. You've got to carry on until you've sorted the matter out. And the I Ching is saying, yes, you can sort it out. But in the short term, you're going to have to carry this burden and it's going to be hard work and it's going to be a bit grueling. So you just have to keep going. And in the end, there will be a resolution, but it just might not be as easy as you'd like. Turning to career, I think in business, in your working life, I think it is a time when you shouldn't be trying to do everything on your own. And I think you need to accept that there are people out there who you can work with and can cooperate with, but you cannot cooperate with everyone. Um, there are just some people who you're not going to get on with. And if you're going to form alliances, um, or get involved with teamwork, you've got to say, well, who are these people? Um, because there are just some people you just don't get on with. And finding these people may be hard work. And, you know, even if you are surrounded by people at work, um, your workmates, colleagues, whatever, you may feel still that you're alone, somewhat isolated, that they're not you're not being taken as seriously as you'd like. People aren't listening to you. And you really would, you know, you'd like to reach out to them, but it, it's just going to be hard work. And that might mean that you end up having to take responsibility for things in a way that may feel a little bit overwhelming. And of course, that leads to... Um, the second hexagram, preponderance of the great. So whatever you're doing, you may have to accept that, you know, by the end of a week, as you move towards the end of the week, um, it will be down to you to make things happen. And I suppose this is particularly the case if you're, if you're self-employed or if you have your own business. You know, you can't trust anyone 
else except for you. And that means that you're going to have to take the burden, um, whatever that burden is. You're perhaps going to have to fill in for other people. You're going to you can't trust trust people to do things. You can't rely on people to do things. Yes, there will be a few people who will eventually come around to your way of thinking and will will offer their support, but perhaps not to the extent to which you had expected. So do be ready to pick up the burden and be able to continue with the burden. And you can't just stop what you're doing and panic and say, I need help. You have to keep going. Once you've made the commitment, keep going. And it is tough. But I think if you keep going and you don't drop the burden, uh, you will be able to cross the finishing line. So... I think there could be a fortunate end to the week, but it just could be a little bit exhausting. And finally, there is uh, the question of relationships. And this first hexagram 45 gathering together, in a sense, it is all about relationships and the fact that you should be with other people. Yeah, that is really important. You should... Um, try to form as many different relationships as possible. And I think that you're going to get a strong sense this week that there are certain people who you should be with, that you are, you somehow, you, you, you somehow, there is a sense of belonging, uh, that you're meant to be with someone um, on any level. I'm not necessarily just talking about romance at whatever you've got work to do you've you've got common interests um you're meant to be together you're meant to be working together and there is that feeling but at the same time when you actually try to engage with people whether it's one to one or in a group you're still going to feel a sense that you are on the fringes that you're not in the center of things that you're on the periphery that other people are not really taking you seriously and that it could be difficult to relate to them. But I think it's not its not a terrible situation. I think it's just something that you've just got to work with and work on. And maybe that's what the next hexagram, Preponderance of the Great, is all about. And... You know, this hexagram, Preponderance of the Great, is about you taking responsibility. So this would mean, for example, if you were involved in a relationship, particularly the kind of relationship where they are joint, where there are joint responsibilities. I mean, I suppose marriage, a business partnership, those kind of things, where there are definite joint responsibilities, then it may be a situation where it is down to you to take the burden. It just perhaps seems that the other person is not really willing to to do the kind of work that you're you, that you'd expect of them, and you're you're going to have to end up doing all the work and perhaps taking all the initiatives. And um, it's it's going to be it's going to be tough, but I suppose you have to um, envisage what you want from. A particular relationship and what the goal of a relationship is and envisage what it is and then do the work so it's it's going to be a heavy burden and it might be really irritating you're taking this burden you're taking all this responsibility other people are not doing anything and not um, living up to their responsibilities and that may irritate you but I don't really think it's necessarily a question of blame you know, it's easy to blame someone. If you're doing all the work and, other, and another person is doing nothing, it's easy to blame them. But I don't think that's what it's about. I think it's just about the situation as it is now. For some reason, right now, it is you who have to take the responsibilities. It's, it's you who have to take the initiative. It's you who have to do all the work. And for one reason or another, the other person is just not going to be in a position to do it. At least not going to be in a position to do it in the way you would expect but try not to take it personally I, I, I and I and I really would emphasize that I don't think it's about blame and that's it 
for this week. That's the uh, that's the I Ching, and um, in a week's time, I will do another video for what would that be for the week starting on Monday, May the thirteenth. So, thank you very much for listening. Uh, I hope you found that video useful. If you did find it useful, I'd be grateful if you were to like the video, indicate that you liked it. If you are not subscribed, I'd be incredibly grateful if you were to subscribe. And if you want to buy me a coffee, there is a link in the description. So thanks again for listening, and I will talk to you again very soon.